Hello, welcome to our IES expert discussion on habitats. Today we'll be discussing the importance of habitats as well as some of the recent developments in policy and what they mean. The IES hosts a series of interdisciplinary discussions bringing together experts on a topic from different perspectives to discuss a common policy challenge. Initially, six discussions were held covering topics related to climate change ahead of COP26, but subsequent conversations have addressed climate, land, nature, and other environmental challenges. The subject matter of this discussion today is focused on the crucial role of habitats and ecosystems, which can be understated or underappreciated in policy conversations with significant consequences for the natural environment. Environmental science is uniquely positioned to consider the importance of habitats, the interactions they have with other natural systems, and the best way to approach habitats in policy to secure multiple benefits for society, the economy, and the environment. There's been much policy activity related to habitats recently between the big news at the global scale with COP15 and the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and various policy announcements across the UK ranging from the new Environmental Improvement Plan and the retained EU law revocation bill to biodiversity net gain and Scotland's fourth national planning framework. We've seen lots of ambition for action, but lots of potential challenges as well. So should we expect a big shift or business as usual? What does the future hold for habitats? We'll start off by bringing in each panelist to introduce themselves and let us know a little bit about their background. Then we'll go back down the line to get those first comments on where we are with habitats and why they matter so much. Hi there, I'm Helen M Embleton and I'm a principal consultant um, within a, a medium sized consultancy. Um, my background is um, that I um, provide ecological advice to developers, um, but I also input um, to master planning and landscape uh, scale planning uh, works that are happening. Um, I've got probably about 20 years experience in the in the field. Hi, I'm Paula Wakelin. I'm an associate ecologist with Atkins. Been an ecologist for quite a while now, and I'm a HRA specialist, that's Habitat Regulation Assessment Specialist. Um, yeah, looking forward to today's discussion. I'm Paul Watts. Um, I'm uh, an associate director at Atkins, and I've been um, in the field of ecology for a little over 15 years now. Um, my background is ornithology, but I um, also specialise in um, HRAs with regards, particularly to, um, to to ornithology, but but in general as well. Yeah, hi, Mark Everard. I'm I'm sort of uh, a prof at a couple of universities, a consultant, uh, author, and do a bit of TV as well. Uh, running a couple of local species recovery projects in my garden pond and my aquarium, and my cat helps me. And uh, I'm also vice president of the IES. I've been in the game rather a long long time than you you guys as well. <laughs> Uh, it's good. We've, we've got four uh, quite uh, different but interlocking specialisms here. So hopefully we should have, be able to have a really interesting discussion about how some of those different elements interact as we go. So let's hop straight into that discussion and throw it right back to you for your reactions to everything that's happening in the world of habitats. Where are we with habitats? So Helen, let's start with you. Uh, oh, that is a huge question. To be honest, I feel as though we, we have a legal framework in place that as a consultant, the, the legal and, and policy frameworks are what we have to work within. However, there is so much more that could be happening. And that's probably the bit that we need to be focusing on is to, um, to, to try and get actual benefit from the regulatory system to make sure that um, as ecologists, the mitigation that we're putting into place is actually meaningful and that it's useful um, and providing a benefit. Um, but as well as that, I think there's probably a lot of untapped potential that we could um, be making much greater use of. Great. Thank you, Helen. Let's uh, come to Paula for your initial reactions. Yeah, I, I just feel that uh, habitats are probably facing the same challenges that they always have with um, loss, degradation, and they get just increasing pressure from uh, recreation and, and sort of coastal squeeze. We've just got a lack of resilience in the system. Although we've got that, that protection mechanism there, it, we've got that um, you know, the definite lack of resilience, especially in the sort of face of climate change and, and the likes. And there's a lot of our habitats, although protected, they're, you know, they're not in great condition, they're in unfavorable condition. And 
suffering from that lack of connectivity, lack of buffers, a whole habitat system just needs a bit of TLC. Thank you. Um, and let's uh, get an initial opinion from Paul. Hi, yes. Um, yeah, I completely agree with those points. Um, I think the other thing to mention, of course, is that, yes, it's very important to look at habitats um, and, and whole areas, but, but it's also that, that linkage between different areas, that connectivity, that resilience to, uh, to change, be that pressure from climate or from, from development, etc. So I think it's a, it's a very difficult thing to, to tackle, but we need to not only look at the habitats themselves and, and, and um, protecting them, but we also need to be thinking about the bigger picture, um, this kind of resilience for the future, if you like, and, and how they are, are linked to each other and how we can uh, provide that connectivity between, between different areas. Thank you, Paul. And let's uh, bring in Mark now for an initial opinion. Well, I think we're stranded between the wrong paradigms. You know, conservation in the modern sense started off really post-war, post-Second World War, when we realised population growth building was putting pressures on. So we, we, we entered the, that sort of fortress conservation type model. And a lot of our legislation is locked into that paradigm. Of course, you know, 2011, we, with John Lawton's report uh, that we're all familiar with, bigger, better, more joined up. And to me, more joined up is is really what it's about rather than the bigger and the better. And we've got some um, less forceful bits of legislation, nature recovery networks and so forth, that begin to look at opportunities for joining up. But but not really with the same weight as 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 the as the fortress stuff. But we are in another we are in a third paradigm that the legislation hasn't really connected with which is looking at the functions of nature what does nature do what services does it provide what resilience does it build into the continued continuity of nature but also the continuity of the societal benefits and we're still rather stuck in trying to put humpty dumpty back together when the reality is that in a lot of this patchwork of protected habitats we have under a changing climate and under a fragmented um, set of land uses, species that formerly existed there maybe can't subsist there anymore. And I give plenty of examples of nature reserves that have become prisons rather than sort of living, um, living cells. So moving into a paradigm of, of functional protection of landscape rather than, you know, as I said, putting Humpty Dumpty back together, which, which we're rather hidebound towards at the moment moment. Thank you for that Mark. I really like the idea of the uh, the, the habitats becoming uh, prisons. I think it, it speaks into that issue of connectivity again that I think uh, everybody's touched on to an extent. So so let's start the discussion there then maybe with connectivity. How can we leverage some kind of progress for connectivity when a lot of the time we are looking at individual sites when the, the policy and regulatory levers are happening? How do we get more connectivity? Can I just say, I'm really hopeful for uh, local nature recovery strategies and getting to that local scale, looking at um, you know where the sites of value are, how they could be joined up, uh, green and blue infrastructure, and uh, thinking of it from, from that perspective, for a start. I would agree with that. Although what I'm seeing is that we we have almost a disengagement um, where the strategies are, are you know in place and and developing to allow that connectivity to be better, but it's such a slow moving process that to actually get anything um, on the ground of benefit um, is incredibly slow moving. So you you you're in this horrible middle ground at the moment where. You know, the, the, the likes of yourselves and, and, and the work that I do, we're trying to promote good mitigation that would be in place and good enhancement um, that would be in place for a proposed development. But it's taken in, a, it needs to be taken in isolation because everything's still very site orientated and we don't really have that outlook um, uh, as far as connecting individual sites up to the wider landscape and I, I think there's there's more work that needs to be done to connect those two sort of elements of the, the chain. We're very locked into um, feudal system of property rights you know that that's underneath it or the developer comes along they bought the land they want to do this they want to do that the first question isn't what function is the land producing what what are the, the flows of societal benefits and the connectivity of species and all the rest of it. The first question is, 
how can I maximize my economic return on this on this land? That's not just built development. As I look out in the River Valley here, where I live in, you know, North Wiltshire, you know, that land is is managed to the economic benefit of the of the owner. And of course, that creates benefits as well as disbenefits for the public. So, you know, this is why I keep coming back to functions and services and acknowledging that landscapes, sites produce flows of societally beneficial services. And we can exploit them for for personal uh, personal wealth, personal benefit, but we need to, a, a system that actually acknowledges that landscapes are functional, not just assets to be to be monetized. And we are rather locked into that monetarist worldview at the moment. I, I want to bring in Paul because Paul, you also talked a little bit about connectivity in the intro. Uh, do you have the same opinion as the others? I think I have the same opinion, but I think maybe as Paul had touched on this, I, I think it could come in at a very different levels and I think really one of the key things we can do at a local planning level is not just look at these kind of this is the project this is the impact it's had and these are the gains that we we're going to make up for it but actually challenge the, the locally to be considering are those gains going to increase connectivity or, or or at least maintain quality connectivity are they providing habitats that are actually in a local or regional um, context um, of high value and, 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 and most appropriate and applicable for that place. So uh, I think I'm, I'm just adding to the points the others have made, but I think there's that kind of idea that at different levels, we shouldn't just be kind of, you know, looking for, for gains or whatever. They've, they've got to be well thought out and actually um, have. So, so, for example, metrics, they're great, but, but we need to be thinking about connectivity as well, um, uh, which, you know, should, should add into the... Uh, into the question and into the interpretation. And in terms of that local level, then, in terms of making those decisions, which are, I suppose, ecologically informed, and uh, to put it in your words, Mark, that respect these services and functions that we attach to ecosystems and to nature. Do we think that the expertise exists currently? And how might we leverage that expertise to ensure that local nature recovery strategies are reflecting connectivity, are reflecting these functions and services. How, how do we think we can best leverage that kind of expertise to make sure that these are going to be useful strategies? Just two things straight off the top of my head. One is, what the hell do we mean by nature? So, you know, with the HS2, I've seen trees uprooted and moved to places, but that's because we can see trees. We can't see mycorrhiza. Uh, and actually, what do we mean by nature? Is it, is it like a stamp collector sort of approach? You know, Humpty Dumpty is a big thing. He's on the wall. We can put him back on the wall. But what about the chicken that laid him? And, you know, sorry, I've just abstracted this metaphor beyond, beyond, uh, beyond breaking point. But do we understand nature, firstly? Or are we, are we just trying to create an idealised chocolate box picture of the world? And I, I kind of fear we are. And, and I know I'm a stuck record when it comes to functions and services. But if we mine down later, uh, further down, what is that system doing? What, what's its function? What, what flows of benefits come from it? And uh, therefore, what are the critical things to protect? And those can be critical things for, I mean, I was involved in a city uh, design in South Africa. You know, the developer said, how can I get this grid system onto this protected wetland? And we said, well, you can't because it's a protected wetland. But if you if you turned it into bent lines instead of straight lines, then you've actually increased your um, real estate value because of connection with blue and green spaces. Uh, those people are now in prison because they put straight lines uh, on, on the wetland uh, where our overwintering swallows actually live. But it, it's to change the thinking. Landscapes do things that benefit nature and people. So let's put that into the ground level of how we think about how we develop. We don't do that at the moment. We just sort of say, oh, there's a very nice tree. Maybe we can move that somewhere, which which doesn't work. Um, we're so fixated on, on the, as it were, the hardware rather than the software of the system. Do you know, just to, to add to that point that you made, Mark, um, uh, very often I see uh, proposals where uh, putting in a bit of grass and putting some trees in is described as being a uh, sort of woodland creation and woodland just doesn't uh, a, a few trees flung onto some grass um, you, you need the whole soil uh, structure and um, you know everything that goes with that so I think there's probably 
a lot that we could be doing to look at the habitats that are being created to make sure they're in the right place, um, they're serving the right function, um, and they are being uh, designed to, to look at everything that that habitat would need to be able to self-sustain itself. Because again, um, very often when you, you, uh, you're you looking at uh, planning applications, there'll be you know, a five or a 10 year management plan for landscaping that will go along with that. Um, that ideally what should be happening is that you're creating um, good quality habitats. Um, they might need some more and then some help to become established, but thereafter, they should be completely self-sustaining. Um, and I think that's that's that would be a lovely place to get to. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near it, um, but I, I think that's what we should be striving towards. And sometimes that, that might mean leaving a habitat to, to generate and uh, to, to do its own thing. Um, but again, sometimes the system doesn't like that do nothing standoffish approach. Um, so I think that that kind of needs to be recognised as well. It's it's um, managing the habitat for the right reasons and not just because it, you need to tick a box somewhere. I think there's a, there's a lot of poor practice out there and there are lots of good things going on. Um, we're in a fantastic position at the moment. We've got BNG, it's about to become mandatory sort of in November. And we're certainly encouraging our clients to consider nature-based solutions uh, with, all the, with all the benefits. We can almost prove all the benefits now with, you know, with natural capital and the uh, ecosystem services that are going to be delivered. So it's, uh, it's, it's a positive time, I think, to look forward. Um, I'm just wanting to do a bit. So my question then is, if we've got uh, quite a bit of bad practice out there at the moment, What's missing? How do we get to, to good practice across the board? Will uh, BNG uh, get us there university or do we think there's there's more that needs to be done? Um, BNG is great. Uh, it has its place, but we need other things alongside as well. Just everyone doing their bit to um, look at either rewilding or you know, reintroducing sort of, um, more natural processes into habitats and yeah, getting that connectivity. I think I have a different view on BNG to, to Paula. Uh, I've got a PhD student who's uh, applying it along with a few other tools uh, to development site, um, including Natural England desired hab, hab and BAP enhancement on site. And what happens is because you take away one bit of habitat and replace it with another, you cannot improve the site by BNG. In fact, it, it decrements. Um, so BNG is a very, very blunt tool. And I like the idea, I mean, it sounds great, 10% uh, nature enhancement is, is fantastic, but the tool itself doesn't work, if I can put it bluntly in practice, which is a shame. Also, it's meant to be, whilst mandatory, it's meant to be decision support. And then that raises the question of supporting whom and where is the depth of expertise to provide the expert um, overview, the expert interpretation. So if a site is improving HAP and BAP uh, objectives from Natural England, how come it can't improve BNG? And, and do the decision makers understand that? Um, you know, by and large, um, local authorities are under a great deal of financial pressure and, uh, you know, aren't eco ecological experts and yet are making their decisions based on some fairly simple um, BNG outputs. You can improve BNG on a rubbish site, but anything that isn't rubbish, it, it's almost impossible. And I've heard anecdotal um, stories of, of developers who are sort of weed killing a site to turn it into a rubbish site so that they can demonstrate 10% improvement from rubbish. Um, so you can gamify all these things and that will happen in the, in the cut and thrust of the dirty world we live in so the tools need to be much more sophisticated and you know I, I can talk more about the functional assessment tools i'll give other people a voice first but things i've developed for the ramsar convention that are now international standard do systematize some of this stuff in a transferable way i think on, on that point um with the bng and I, I think it's hard to um 
to to say exactly how you'd replace it in another way but i think i think like you said the, the onus really you you can do something and it doesn't necessarily an improvement in fact quite often it isn't and i think what i was trying to say earlier is that there should be an onus on the person providing that um proposal that they can justify why the the new proposed um habitat creation or improvements um are actually of benefit to that local area um and to, to, to the surrounding habitats and maybe even um uh, help with the kind of um uh, connectivity issues we were talking about earlier so so maybe that as rather than just putting a calculation through that there, there should be um uh, an onus to try and provide some additional justification um we've all seen um images of, of um, trees being planted on high quality um, grassland um, and, and, and ecologists feeling rather disappointed because because it was great as it was and it wasn't the best place to do it um, and I think that comes from that kind of possible lack of um, consideration of of what was there in the first place and, and what you're doing how that's actually going to improve the area locally and, and provide some benefit rather than just uh, meteor calculation. I think um, BNG is not perfect and um, it's sort of it's been highlighted recently, or well, certainly I've seen in a couple of articles that it doesn't encourage people to sort of strive to create priority habitats. You're sort of getting higher scores for lower quality habitats. So definitely not perfect, but it's it's a tool. It's a tool we didn't have, and let's let's use it as we can. I think I would just add that obviously we're we're still in relatively early days of uh, BNG being rolled out you know obviously it's it's just becoming mandatory um, in England and Wales um, we haven't uh, got that just yet within Scotland although uh, the new MPF4 uh, very clearly states um, that they'll be looking for you know some kind of system uh, to, to give the same results up here um, I think as far as the expertise um, that we have within the sector are concerned. We obviously have a lot of um, ecologists within the consultancies that are growing their expertise and becoming very proficient in uh, the nuances of BNG. But whenever we submit that to planning authorities and to Natural England and Nature Scott up here, um, they don't have the time or the expertise to be able to um, process all of the information that we're generating. And by nature, uh, I, I feel as though there's a skills gap um, within uh, the LPAs and within, you know, with, within the regulator, the re regulatory side, um, because they just don't have the resources to, to be able to grow as fast as they need to, uh, to be able to um, make sure that we're getting the benefit for uh, the, the developments that are coming through. This is a really interesting point you make, Helen, that there's probably in many ways more expertise than there's ever been uh, now in, in consultancy in the wider environment sector. But what we don't have is expertise in these decision making bodies in order to apply that in a way that that's useful and i'd like to i'd like to place that in the context of the dichotomy that i think mark mentioned a moment ago where we simultaneously perhaps need more sophisticated tools for making the kind of ecosystems level assessments we need to be making if we want to address these these concerns across the piece but at the same time we maybe don't have the expertise that we need to apply the simpler tools that we currently have within local authorities and planning organizations. So we've got this quite difficult dual challenge potentially then of how we level up expertise and like you say, Helen, skills, whilst at the same time upping the level of skill we're trying to get to that is native to these decision makers. So it's, it's potentially quite a significant challenge that we're looking at. And I think, I, I think we have to take Paula's point that this is maybe a, a long term thing that we need to look at. We're very fixated on quantification, and I think that's a problem. Things we can count, I know, I know the mantra of if you can't count it, you can't manage it, but things we can count are um, often not always the most important. So, you know, the aesthetic value of a, of a, of a place and you know, the spiritual values, those softer values are just one example, one of the areas where um, we undervalue what nature is doing for, for, for mental health even for air quality and physical health. Um, 
So beginning to, to value in, in semi-quantitative or qualitative ways rather than simple count the trees ways is I think a really important thing to capture a breadth of societal value that currently just isn't part of the of the adding up of the values of nature. I think there's a point of then it being really important that choices or sort of or approaches are underpinned by science and evidence. Um, we've increasingly sort of had to evidence certainly mitigation and compensation approaches, um, whilst writing say like HRA. So the sort of a bit of accounting um, and monitoring and stock taking uh, is still needs gonna it still needs to go on. But there are other it's not just the, the traditional hard metrics that, that that can be quantified or can be semi-quantified. You know, the the the, the, the rules rapid assessment wetland ecosystem service tool that I developed for the Ramsar Commission that is now a global standard is semi-quantitative. Because if you try to say what's the system doing and you just rely on the quantified bit then you're automatically veering it towards near market. So uh, it's a bit like my critique of the ONS um, national natural capital accounts, which are based on you know, transfer values. In other words, what's nature doing for the economy, not what is nature doing? Um, and I do feel we're still very myopic and, and very focused on our exploitation of nature rather than looking at inherent and and wider values of nature that uh, if we erode them then we are impoverished so yes we should try and put it onto an accounting basis but not just be locked into very very simplistic metrics that um, skew us towards liquidation of nature in fact we talked a little bit earlier about how science interacts with policy and some of these decisions. What would an ideal interface between science and policy look like in this context? I, I come back to who's the decision maker. Um, we tend to sort of think that, you know, government is in the middle and it's the arbiter of everything. And ultimately, I guess it is. And, and unfortunately, we get the politicians, which is not, not the people I trust the most. But there's a whole ecosystem of NGO and, and other um, consultant, others out there that that, that is uh, an ecosystem of expertise, and you know rather than putting things in simple numbers that goes to political decision making level, where there isn't the expertise to discern what that means, ignores the fact that there's a huge amount of, of devolved expertise across the environmental science network across the profession that could be better used. So in many ways, using that expert ecosystem to, to populate the case for decision makers is maybe where should, we should go rather than trying to simplify it so that the guy at the top who hasn't got a clue what he's talking about makes the decision or woman, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all aware of um, times where we hear that, you know, the government's had scientific advice and chosen not to, um, not to follow um, the advice that they've been given. Um, and I think um, there's a risk that that could happen um, again and again. And I think um, by, you know, using evidence, using good news stories, sharing it amongst ourselves and, and using our wider um, organisations to kind of really engage with the public and, and get public backing and public understanding of the issues, um, it becomes not just a governmental decision, but, but something that um, we're all aware of and we, we, all, we all feel it is appropriate and I think Mark you mentioned about um, uh, well-being earlier and I think that's something that people are becoming more and more aware of you know green space is good for the mind um, and we, 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 we kind of we've got an, an in there and we just need to keep building on that and making people aware that they need these things around them um, and it's not just a green park that doesn't do anything but serve the function for kicking a football it's that kind of ecosystem that's that's bringing nature bringing as you said lots of ecosystem services and just providing a, a good system that, that helps us and, and making people aware of that so it doesn't become a governmental decision it becomes something that we're, we're all invested in. Paul what you've just said there sort of touches on the the sort of placemaking sort of type policies that that sit probably higher than ecology and habitats and I think that's a really important point that having that cross linkage and that recognition that 
the habitat can have greater importance to other disciplines, whether it's, you know, looking at health and well-being or looking at um, sort of flood risk and water management or even sort of noise buffering of woodlands between the more rural and industrialised sites and things like that. I think there's, I think there needs to be a, a greater recognition that there's the, a habitat in itself offers so many more opportunities and uh, benefits um, than, than it just being, like you say, a, a, a square of grass um, for kicking a football about or walking the dog. Yeah, I think Natural England have just launched the uh, National Green Infrastructure Framework, and that's massively socio-environmental led, focused on urban areas. So the, the Green Infrastructure Framework snuck out on the same day as the, the EIP, uh, just a, a week ago now. It's still naturally very early days in terms of reflecting on what that framework might do. But what what optimistically might we hope it could do as it fits into this conversation? Shifting the dial on public and, 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 and policymaker and, and decision maker perceptions of nature. You know, the, the, great, the great public kind of looks at nature as this altruistic thing out there that we should protect and you see language we must protect nature we must save the planet actually we should save ourselves and how do we achieve that by protecting the habitats that, that purify the air that help address the flooding that that, that make places livable and, and and attractive and recreational and spiritually enhancing and that contain the breadth of species that these are our inheritance. Um, so it's, it's a much more nuanced uh, awareness of what nature is. We see a little bit of it creeping into the broadcast media. Um, it could go an awful lot more. But uh, yeah, you know, forest bathing and all of these things, they're sort of tiptoeing into the world of, you know, nature matters. Nature matters for my physical, my mental, my my emotional well-being, the future of my kids, and all the rest of it, um, rather than this this thing. Oh, we should protect this thing randomly, altruistically, out there. Uh, we're protecting ourselves by because we're part of nature. I, I'm breathing nature right now. Yeah, I would completely agree with that, Mark. Um, I've spent a long time uh, going into local schools to talk to uh, the kids about nature and about the environment. And very often it's a thing that's out there. So they'll talk about the lions and the savannas or they'll talk about the um, deforestation of the rainforests. And whenever I bring it right back to the local woodland um, that's just round the corner and the badgers and the bats and the, the invertebrates that live there, they all of a sudden realise that nature is right on top of us and it's all around us and I think I think a lot of people I think it's getting it's got better over the years but I think a lot of people still see nature as being very dislocated from their everyday lives and it's a thing that they will go and visit or you know it's almost like it's a nice day out kind of um kind of mm. thing and I think it's that that we need to change I think we need to um change how people think about um, the environment that's around them and make people realise that they're actually connected to it um, because I think a lot of people have become very disassociated with it. Someone ought to write a book called The Ecology of Everyday Things. Oh, I have. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, there's, uh, it underpins uh, quite a wide range of things, doesn't it, around the ways we think about nature, the natural world and all of these things attached to it. Um, Helen, certainly you're talking to, to young people, to children about this, and it sounds like that's been successful. But do we think there's uh, there's anything else we can be doing to help? Well, again, this, this is probably um, sort of going off on a wild, uh, a, a, a kind of wild tangent. But um, what I find whenever um, I've, over the years I've, I've done uh, a, f a fair number of uh, schools visits and very often, the teachers and themselves feel very overwhelmed and they don't know where to start with it. So that's why they go to the deforestation of the rainforests and the things that are well documented but are you know completely disassociated to our local environment. Um, and I feel that if you want to make a, a, a meaningful and a long-term change, 
get the kids early. Um, it, uh, I, I used to be involved in the waste management side of things. And whenever we were just bringing it, starting to bring in curbside collections and the uh, new recycling uh, uh, sort of schemes, it, what we would do is we would go into the, the schools and teach the kids how to uh, recycle and then they would take it home and it would be much more successful. And, and um, I think that that is a very good way of sort of get, getting, getting people really early, get the right messages in there and it stays with them the rest of their lives. I think we could um, make better friends with media, broadcast media. Um, I, I personally, I'm a media tart, so I would say that. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I've got colleagues in the BBC that I've, I've done broadcast with, but often will phone me up and say, you know, what's the angle on this thing? The point is, these people reach into people's living rooms and there is an ecosystem message in virtually everything. You know, uh, even, even, you know, military conflict, people are in military conflict because of a limited resource of some kind, being it land, landscapes, whatever. We might call it ideology, politics, whatever. Underneath it, there's generally a, a natural resource issue of one kind or another. So there's always an ecosystem story to tell in pretty much anything. And, and if we cultivate friends with the people who can put messages into people's living rooms, then we've got much more leverage than you know, writing another paper in a scientific journal that you know about three of your mates are going to read. So we've, we've talked about a very broad range of issues so far. I would like to bring us back to one of the ones we talked about quite early on. Both uh, Paula and Paul, to some extent, talked about resilience and not only the lack of resilience maybe that exists now, but also the ability to create resilience. Yeah, I think um, good quality habitats are generally a bit more resilient um, like on a catchment scale as well, sort of it goes to that sort of level and um, everything that happens within a catchment uh, affects the watercourses within it. And um, you do need to take a more strategic approach. Um, we have to be thinking ahead about, you know, sea level rise and um, very increasing temperatures and sort of more variable sort of weather conditions. Our habitat's going to be able to cope with that. And it's resilience in the terms of uh, population growth as well. Uh, a lot of sites are under uh, a lot of recreational pressure or nutrient loading. And it's bearing in mind those factors when we're you know, advising our clients and um, looking at protected sites that just all needs to be borne in mind. Actually, that might be an area where the, the planning system could um, be more proactive. Uh, you know, all the local authorities have their local development plans in place, and they will outline st strategic areas, um, you know, for development or whatever else. But actually, maybe within that 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 um, framework, um, there should be more focus on um, looking at catchment um, impacts of those. The, the developments that they outline as being okay within their uh, within their uh, development plans, um, but yeah, the, the planning system's there, so it would make sense to tie into it to 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 make it work better. Yeah, I think when we when we're looking at say for example habitat regulations assessments, I think we're we're bound to think about things like resilience in terms of. How, how resilient that habitat will be going forwards, but also how it maybe contributes to, to um, <clears throat> resilience in the wider area. So for example, it's my ecosystem services and how it might you know, help against flooding, et cetera. And I just think maybe that needs to be rolled out to other, other areas as well. And it probably is in some ways, but just make sure that's really in the, in the bones of when we do our assessments and, and, and when, you know, at, at all levels, when we're considering projects and plans. Um, and proposals, um, you know, whether those factors are taken into account, maybe that's something we can we can try and push push forward. I mean, there is a conflict across scales here that that is, is terribly difficult um, to unpick. I mean, we've created this this world that we live in. Strategically, you know, landscapes have important functions from which many many public uh, and ecosystem benefits arise. 
but they are parcels of land in private ownership with lots of private property rights. So we're, we're trying to think strategically about a place that is a fragment of, of protected private rights. And I mean, one thing I learned from you know 22 years in the public sector is that you draw a line on a map, that's a political statement. Um, you're gonna get attacked. <laughs> um, which is why catchment flood management plans here, Upper Bristol Avon, this is all in the, it would be nice if this was wetted so that Bath and Bristol didn't get flooded zone, but there's no, individual field boundaries on that map um, it's it's aspirational so we we have to sort of find other mechanisms in this feudal world that we live in um, probably market-based mechanisms um, to create signals and you know as as ecologists the market is a, is a pretty dirty word I know but you know we have things like elms emerging environmental land management schemes um, that are in many ways a sort of a lever to um, shape the decisions of private landowners. Now, I know currently in Whitehall, you know, the landowners really would rather just keep getting money for owning land, which is which is the feudal norm. But if we are serious about public money for public good, which is the mantra, then we should be helping government say what public good means. Um, and many of us have been making ourselves about as unpopular as we've always been by, by, by ramming that message home. But if this is a paradigm change where we say that the way we use landscapes can either be a public disbenefit or a public benefit, then let's get the market working to promote the functional benefits of those landscapes. And probably with a market instrument, given the feudal um, fragmented jigsaw piece landscape that we live in. But that is a lever to argue about the functional importance of landscapes. And I'll put that question back to the rest of the panel about scales, I suppose, that underpins uh, what you've just said, Mark, that we have got lots of different scales here. We've got we've got a UK, we've got devolved administrations, we've got catchments, we've got landscapes, we've got local authorities, and within and across and beyond all of that, we have ecosystems. We've got a lot of different scales here where decisions need to filter across them. In theory, later this year, we're expecting a land use framework that ties that agricultural question to habitats, but also to energy, to buildings and planning. Because my question back then to the rest of the panel is, how do we manage these different scales effectively? I'm not too sure on this one, to be honest with you, Joe. I think um, Mark's made some good points on there. I, I don't have too much to add on this one, um, but um, <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, a real challenge. Absolutely. I would completely agree with that. Uh, that I think that really is the big question is how we how we um, merge all of those those competing uh, factors. Let's take maybe a very specific example of this bigger question is how are we going to make sure that the overall system gives us the priority habitats we need at local levels? Do we have the drivers to make sure that people are opting into creating or enhancing those priority habitats? I think that's quite difficult to answer. I think the tools are potentially there. It depends on the priority habitats because you know, we've got so many that are classified as irreplaceable now that um, we need to be protecting what we've got. I'm just reflecting back on, on the point I made earlier about prisons versus reserves. Um, as one very practical example, Na National Nature Reserve, about 15 miles from here, is North Meadow, Cricklade, uh, which has 80% of the UK's snake's head fritillaries, uh, as well as various other really interesting you know, Ophioglossopholium and, and, and whatever. Now, two winters ago, it was inundated with flood water for months, and this winter it was as well. And there is a very good chance that progressively with successive climate change wet winters, that will eradicate 80% of the British snake's head fritillary population. So the, the, the fortress model um, can't cope with the changing climate as well as the, the, the genetic and the hydrological and, and, and other disconnections that we've created in the landscape. We have to we have to think bigger. We have to think buffer. We have to think connectivity. We have to think mobility of uh, nature in landscapes, um, rather than hoping 
that the, the snakes of fritillaries will continue to prosper in this very changed sort of prison that they live in. So the existing model, it, it, it's a fortress model and, and it's not fit for purpose. So we have to find ways to incentivize um, adjacent land for the migration of species, uh, whilst acknowledging that land in private ownership has all sorts of protected rights. So, you know, top end of the Bristol Avon here, there are fields that are functionally important as floodplain, but the market rewards them to trash them by, by turning it into intensive maize fields that every year you can see the soil level de declining. Hundreds of thousands of years of soil formation end up as a contaminant in the river. Um, so so the, the land use policies we have are, are simply unfit for purpose because they favor private benefit rather than public services. Uh, this is an absolute turning point for me that, that we have to grip that somehow and be accused of being in many ways tyrannical from taking away the rights of the of the landowning classes um, simply because the rights of the landowning classes are being exploited to undermine the rights of the public beneficiaries on the on the more practical level because i think helen in in the contribution that started us all off you also talked about thinking you talked a little bit about getting meaningful improvement and, and getting benefit beyond what what is mandated what kind of change in thinking do you think could help motivate that one helen Again, that's 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 a difficult one. Um, I I think that sort of change really is down to us collectively as um, environmental professionals. Where I think we're at the stage now where the environment and sustainability and all of these buzzwords have been used as a greenwash for so long that we're actually at the point now where we need to stand up and be able to say at the end of the day that what we did was as good as we could make it. That I, I think with mitigation that everyone's putting forward, whether it's for ecological enhancement or for looking at um, uh, hydrological conditions on sites or whatever, um, I think we need to have the, the, the moral standing to say that we've done what we could in the set of conditions that we were, we were in, we've done the best that we could. Great. Well, thank you, Helen. Um, I think that's actually that's quite a, a good point to to wrap the conversation on because we're we're rapidly running out of time. But I do want to have some final thoughts from each of the panelists on your one big takeaway from the conversation. If you were in a room with the prime minister and the chief executives of all the local planning authorities and everybody else who could possibly need to be involved in these conversations and you could tell them a single thing that uh, you would take away from this discussion what would that thing be so we'll start with mark what's your one final takeaway from the conversation very simply nature is the fundamental wealth underpinning all of our aspirations from, from economic activities through to quality of life livability and the future for, for generations that don't have a voice. And, and if we undermine that, then we are doing everything a disservice. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Paul, what's your final takeaway? I guess final takeaway, obviously it, it's so important for everyone and we just need to increase that awareness and make everyone aware. So I think our duty is to use our evidence and, and research and findings to create positive stories, to create positive news and really bring people on the journey with us so that everyone's invested in understanding why this is of benefit to them. Absolutely, Paul. Thank you for that. And uh, Paula, what's your final takeaway? Well, my message would be don't scrap the habitat regulations. Let's, let's keep our uh, most important sites protected and um, let's, let's reward our national parks. Great. Thank you, uh, Paula. And uh, Helen, the, the final word is going to go to you. What's your final takeaway from this discussion? Uh, probably to sum up what everybody else has said um, that we need to keep our habitat protections in place extend that so that they can actually function as networks um, and that at the end of the day everything that we do should be science based um, to get the best outcome for nature as possible. Thank you Helen and thank you all again for participating in today's expert discussion on habitats. 
If you've enjoyed watching this discussion, you can find other expert discussions on related topics on our YouTube channel, where you'll be able to find all sorts of content, not just on habitats and nature, but on topics across the environmental sciences. Today's discussion has been part of our Future of ES23 Horizon Scanning and Foresight project, where we're bringing together voices from across the environmental sciences through discussions like this one, with the goal of creating a vision statement that sets out the different potential futures for the environmental sciences, as well as how we can create the kind of future that we want to see. If you want more information about the project, it's available on the IES website. If you found this discussion interesting, you can show your support for the IES by becoming an affiliate, or if you're a professional in the environmental sector working with science, consider becoming a member of the IES. In the details below, you'll find a link to our social media and the IES website. Make sure you follow us across platforms so that you're up to date with all the latest events, videos, and CPD opportunities. And remember to like the video, share it with your friends and colleagues, and let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you again to our expert panel for providing us with such great reflections on the importance of habitats and everything that we're currently dealing with in the natural world. It's always fantastic to be able to draw on such deep expertise. And uh, I'll look forward to welcoming each of you, I think, to discussions again in the future. But for now, thank you for participating. Thank you to the audience for watching. And we'll see you again soon.